We're grateful to best-selling and beloved author Gretchen Rubin for being with us today. She's also, I might brag, one of the library's trustees. She's the author of the essential book, The Happiness Project, Happier at Home, and The Four Tendencies, among other titles, and the co-host of The Happier Podcast. Links to buy Gretchen's books are available at the listing of this event on the library's website. Today, she's going to share some of her wisdom about being happier at home and as many of us transition back into normal after being quarantined at home. Do add your questions in the chat and she'll address them in a bit. Thank you so much. And now, Gretchen Rubin. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much, Sarah. No one is a bigger fan of the New York Society Library than I am, so it's a great honor and a pleasure to be here today. Um, before I launch into talking about you know, how we can all be happier, I really do want to take a moment to acknowledge the protests uh, of the past weeks um, on behalf of racial justice and in response to the death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and so many other things. Um, I, this has been such a powerful and profound moment. Uh, I think it's leading to a lot of soul searching. I know I've been doing a lot of soul searching and asking, you know, what am I doing in my everyday life to help my country live up to its most noble ideals? Um, this is a question that we should be thinking about all the time, obviously. Um, but I think now more than ever, um, it's something that's on our minds and is uh, shaping our actions in the future. Um, now, at a time like this, it's easy to think, I ask myself this question all the time, is, is it selfish for me to think about my own happiness? Is it trivial? Is it self-centered for me to even be thinking in those terms? Um, but here's what the research shows, and I, and I think common experience confirms this. If you think about the people in your life and your own experience, is that actually happier people are more interested in the problems of other people, and they're more interested in trying to solve the problems of the world. They give away more money. They volunteer more time. They're more likely to vote. They make better leaders and better team members. They're more likely to help out if a family member or a colleague or a friend needs a hand. Uh, they're healthier. They have healthier habits. Um, when we're unhappy, it's easy to become isolated, defensive, and preoccupied with our own problems. And so when we work to be happier in our own lives, we actually strengthen ourselves to turn outward and to think about the problems of other people and the problems of the world and what we can do to help to bring about change. Um, so I guess if it is selfish to want to be happier, we should be selfish, uh, if only for selfless reasons. Um, so given that, um, what are some things that we can do as part of our ordinary lives to be happier, healthier, more productive, and more creative? Um, so I'm going to talk about a bunch of different concrete things, because I always love, love things to be concrete. Um, so one of the things that we can do is to um, live our values. Um, and I think this, again, is something that we're all thinking about very much at this time. Um, and so, you know, we all have our values, um, but in the tumult of everyday life, sometimes it's easy for days, weeks, months to slip by, and we haven't really done enough to put those values into the world. And that is an immense source of happiness, is to feel like we are living up to our ideals for ourselves, and we are upholding our values in the world. So um, one thing I've, uh, I've thought about and done for many years is power hour. Power hour is pretty you know, it's a small thing. And it's the idea that, you know, things that can be done at any time are often done at no time. And so what I do is I keep a running list of all those little nagging tasks that I just postpone, you know, week after week after week, keep a list. And then once a week for an hour, I tackle them. So this is like change that burned out light bulb, you know, figure out where my the, the misplaced hammer is, uh, look for that book that I've been looking for that somehow is on the wrong shelf. Um, you know, do these little tasks because over time they just sort of drain us and make us feel overwhelmed. None of them is important on its own, but kind of the mass of them make us feel drained. So that's power hour. Uh, but I was thinking that for today's circumstances, maybe it would be good to think of empower hour. Um, when you think of yourself as, okay, I'm going to set aside time every week. An hour doesn't seem like much, but putting it on the calendar is important because, again, things that are done at any time are often done at no time. Have an hour where you say, I'm going to do something to live up to my values. So maybe I'm going to take steps to help people to register to vote. Maybe I'm going to research causes to decide where I want to donate my money. Maybe I'm going to educate myself about some important policy issue that I want to learn more about. Um, so for this one Empower Hour, I'm going to take steps to put my values into the world. Um, and, and just by putting it on the calendar, um, for a lot of us, it makes it much more likely that it happens. And once you get started, often you keep going. You don't limit yourself to an hour, but an hour makes sure that there's at least it, it gets its uh, it doesn't get pushed week after week after week. 
So Empower Hour is kind of a transcendent thing. Um, but then there are there's the things that are very, very like grounded in our own body. And I think the body is a great place um, to begin because our physical experience is always going to color our emotional experience. So we have to think about like, well, what am I doing to keep my body in good shape? And the first thing I would say, and you've heard it before because everybody's always talking about this, but it needs repeating, which is that we need to get enough sleep. Most adults need at least seven hours of sleep, and it makes a huge difference to our focus, our mood, our immune function that everybody's so focused on now, um, the repair of the body in so many ways um, to get enough sleep. Now, these days, because of everything that's going on, a lot of people have disrupted sleep. They have trouble falling asleep, or they wake up in the middle of the night with racing thoughts, um, or they just get caught up in an infinite loop where they just are staying up later and later because the usual architecture of our days has been disrupted. Um, so if this is you, you might want to think about things like setting an alarm for bedtime. You might have an alarm to wake up. Maybe you need an alarm to go to sleep. Uh, getting ready for sleep well before you plan to go to bed so that when you're tired, you're already in your, you know, in your pajamas and your teeth are brushed and, you know, your, like your face is washed so you can just go out, go to bed when you're ready to go to bed. Um, if you have racing thoughts in the middle of the night, what research shows is that if you write those down, um, that will often kind of release your mind um, because the brain is going over and over information to make sure that you don't forget it. If you write it down, then it's memorialized and the, and the mind can release it. Um, also, if you're having trouble sleeping, you might get up for 20 minutes and just do some like quiet activity, not watching TV, not checking your email, not checking the news. But a lot of times if you get up and sort of move around, then you can go back to sleep more easily. Also, if you are having trouble sleeping, a great thing to do, and a great thing to do on its own, and again, you know it, you've heard it a million times, we need to exercise. This is not, you know, training for the marathon. This is movement. This is, maybe it's a 20 minute walk or, you know, just exercise. Um, this for us, of course, is easier in New York City, even today. I think New Yorkers, we tend to walk more than some people in other parts of the country. Um, but it's really, really important. Exercise is like the magical elixir of life. It both energizes us and calms us down. It's really important, again, for that immune function that we're also focused on. And mood and, and energy. Um, people sometimes think, well, I'm too tired to exercise. But actually, exercise tends to boost energy instead of depleting energy, unless you're really exercising kind of at the outer limits of your, of your capacity. Um, and the other thing about uh, exercise is that it helps us sleep. People who exercise fall asleep faster and sleep more deeply. So those two things work together. Um, another thing, um, and this is um, in a book that I'm uh, working on now um, that I think is really great, is if you're feeling overwhelmed, uh, if you're feeling un, you know, like you kind of are spinning out of control, it's great to just really say to yourself, okay, I'm going to get grounded in my body. Now, a lot of people get grounded in their body by focusing on their breath. But I don't know about you, but if I start thinking about my breath, I start feeling like I'm suffocating. It's like nothing interferes with my breathing more than focusing on my breath. Um, but what I like is to tap into the sense of smell. So I really smell a bottle of vanilla. I really smell a grapefruit. I really smell fresh towels. And that makes me, like, takes me. You cannot bookmark a smell. You can't even keep experiencing it for more than just that fleeting moment. So it's something that really takes you into your body right now. Um, or your sense of touch. Maybe really sit down and, and experience, like, the texture of a pillow or the texture of a plant leaf. Um, there's something about really connecting with your body that I think can be um, very grounding and very comforting. Now, so there's the body, there's our values. Another way to think about happiness is, okay, well, what would you say the secret to happiness is? And a key and maybe the key to happiness, and ancient philosophers and contemporary scientists would agree about this, is relationships. To be happy, we need to have enduring intimate bonds. We need to feel like we belong. We need to be able to confide. Um, we need to be able to get support. And just as important for happiness, we need to be able to give support. Um, again, this is the idea of putting your values into the world. Giving support to others makes us happier too. It's the whole do good, feel good. Now, some people criticize that because they think, well, it's not possible to be altruistic. But I'm like, this is one of the best things about human nature, uh, that people feel happier when they're doing good for other people. Um, so that's something to think about in our relationships. How can we do good for other people? Because that's going to make them feel 
happier, it's going to make us feel happier too. Um, so some little concrete things you could do for your relationships. One is just to try to signal warmth. I think, and I, I see this in my neighborhood, and I imagine you do too, that I feel like people are really going out of their way to smile and to say hello. Now, of course, we can't see their smiles because they've got their masks on. Um, but you can see people's faces change. You can tell that they're smiling. They're giving a little wave. Um, to kind of create a greater sense of compa companionship and, 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 and neighborliness in this time. Um, I feel like I really appreciate it. I go out with my dog Barnaby um, several times a day and I really see that people are much more likely to just give a quiet hello um, than they usually do or just like a little acknowledgement. And it does make everything feel so much warmer. Um, another thing is if you are, if you are um, safer at home with other people, uh, a nice thing to do is to really acknowledge when people come and go, uh, maybe not from the room, but if somebody's like going out to walk the dog or, you know, drop a letter in the mailbox or something, to really say hello and goodbye every time they come. Because sometimes when people come and go and no one even like looks up from their phone or their book to acknowledge it, it starts to feel like nobody really is paying attention to you. And so really acknowledging when people come and go is a great way to um, create a more tender and uh, affectionate atmosphere. Um, and one thing, you know, we need relationships, but and everyone keeps saying like, this isn't, you know, it's not social distancing, it's physical distancing. Um, but physical distancing is hard. You know, we're used to seeing other people, we're used to being in person. And um, I think we all need to be taking advantage of what technology can offer us. And I see many people doing it. And that's why something like this is a great thing, because we can't be in person, but we can connect this way. It's not the same as being in person. It probably is not as good as being in person, but maybe some people can join who wouldn't otherwise be able to join. And um, it's, it's a way to feel connected. And I think what a lot of people are doing is they're really going out of their way to learn how to use new tools, to adapt to new tools. And then also what I see a lot of people doing, sort of looking out for the people maybe for whom this doesn't come easily and making sure that they feel like they're being checked on and that someone's looking out for them and making sure that they're pulled into a network of social connection and information. Um, because some people are kind of automatically networked up and they're in a million group texts and you know they're like part of this group and I've got, three book clubs that are meeting by Zoom, um, but not everybody has that. And so I think it's great that there are, that people are really looking out for each other and making sure that um, everyone's getting pulled into this, um, into this network. Um, and then the final thing I would say, and then we have some time for questions, um, which Sarah will read, um, is uh, to think about self-knowledge. I mean, you'd think, oh, nothing's easier than knowing myself because I just hang out with myself all day long. But actually, a lot of times we don't really know ourselves. And when we set up our lives in a way that's tailored for us, that reflects our own nature, our own interests, our own value, our own temperament, we're far more likely to be happier. Um, and there's, and they say there are two kinds of people in the world, the kind of people who divide the world into two kinds of people and the kind of people who don't. And I am the kind of people who does. And so I love finding distinctions. Um, and a lot of times these distinctions can really help us show more compassion to ourselves and also show more compassion to other people. So again, if you are safer at home with a bunch of other people and you're spending a lot of time together in ways that you don't usually do, you may be experiencing more conflict. And sometimes understanding these distinctions makes conflicts, makes these kinds of conflicts easier to manage. So one is, this is very obvious, but, I, but some people kind of dismiss it, but it's real and it's powerful, is morning people and night people. This is a real thing. It's largely genetically determined and a function of age. Some people are just that they're more creative and productive and energetic later in the day. And some people are morning people like me. Um, and so if you're thinking about when to schedule something, if you're thinking about like who handles breakfast and who handles dinner, if you're thinking about when certain tasks should happen for yourself and for other people, you want to take into account, well, are you a morning person or a night person? Because a lot of times you can distribute tasks to take advantage of people's natural energy levels. Also, don't oppose your natural energy levels. I think a lot of owls are told, like, you should get up early and, you know, the early bird catches the worm. And if something's important to you, you should get up and do it before work or whatever. No, because they can barely get out of bed. You know, it's time to get to work on time. Um, if you are a night person, you really want to schedule those things at a time when you're at your best. Um, again, there's all this research that shows this is a real thing. It's not that just some people stay up too late, you know, watching reruns of Game of Thrones. No, they're actually wired differently. 
Um, another, uh, another difference that I think comes up a lot now that we're all um, at home a lot is um, simplicity lovers and abundance lovers. So simplicity lovers are people like me. We like empty shelves and bare counters and not much on the walls and not much going on. You know, one little vase with one little rosebud, you know, simple. And then there are abundance lovers though. And abundance lovers love profusion and choice and, and collections and piles and unexpected juxtaposition and a lot going on. And sometimes simplicity lovers will say something like, a cluttered desk means a cluttered mind. You should like, we're gonna have a clean desk policy in this office. Well, that's true for some people, but it's not true for everyone. Abundance lovers thrive in that kind of in abundant environment. So it's not that one person's right or one person's wrong or one person's like, this is the more creative way or the more efficient way. It's just people thrive in different circumstances. So maybe we have to cooperate, but we don't have to convince each other, I'm right, you're wrong, or you're right and I'm wrong. We could both be right for ourselves. And then the final one that I want to mention um, is one that's dear to my heart, which is the difference between abstainers and moderators. And this is if you are uh, facing a strong temptation. Um, and one thing I'm hearing from a lot of people, because I've done a lot of studies of habits, is that for many people, being the safer at home period has really uh, caused them to do a lot more snacking um, because they're just home and they're maybe anxious or uneasy and the food is right there. Um, and so they're trying to manage their eating so that they can eat more healthfully. So this has to do with a strong temptation. So like I have a crazy sweet tooth. Um, for abstainers, it's easier to have none than it is to have a little bit. Um, I can have no Thin Mint cookies or I can have a sleeve of Thin Mint cookies, but I cannot have one Thin Mint cookie. I can't have half a dish of ice cream. I can't have half a brownie. Um, I can have none very easily, but once I start, I'm gonna go all the way. By contrast, moderators are people who do better when they have a little bit of something, or they have it sometimes. You know, they follow the 80-20 rule. Um, you know, these are the people, and maybe you know people like this, maybe you are a person like this, where you're like, I just have a bar of fine chocolate in my desk drawer, and every day or two, I just have one square, and that's all I want. I get a little something for my sweet tooth. I can't live like that. For me, 8 a.m., I'm like, oh my gosh, like it's today, it's my birthday, the day I've had, it's the weather, like now, later, I have to have it. I might as well eat the whole thing and just get it off my mind. Um, and the thing is, moderators and abstainers, it's not that one person's right and one person's wrong, it's that um, we just have different approaches. But often, we will tell each other that we're doing it wrong. As an abstainer, people say to me, you shouldn't be so rigid. You shouldn't demonize certain food. You should learn how to manage yourself and just indulge in moderation. And then I say to moderators, why do you keep changing the rules on yourself? Why don't you just go cold turkey? Like why do you exhaust yourself with all these decisions? Just like, just make a clean decision and let it go. Well, moderation works for some people and abstaining works for some people. Now I can be a moderator when it comes to wine because I don't really like wine. So I can have half a glass of wine. Whereas a friend of mine said, I can have no wine or I can have four glasses of wine. I can't have half a glass of wine. So this is really about strong temptation, how you manage strong temptation. But again, you might be at home with somebody who's like, well, I don't understand why we just can't have ice cream in the freezer. Just have like a half a cup. Don't, just like, don't eat the whole thing. And you're like, oh my gosh, I can't do that. Um, because for some people, it's just very hard to have a little bit. So if one way isn't working for you, try the other way. So the final thing I would say, and then again, we'll have time for your questions, is um, I really do think um, that even in circumstances like we face today, we, which really are circumstances that we've, o we've always faced, this is just bringing it to a head, bringing it to our attention in a very important and significant way. Um, I really do think it's worth the time and the energy uh, and the effort to, to do what we can within our own lives and our own circumstances to be as healthy and happy and as productive and as creative as we can be, um, both for ourselves and our own happiness and also because it is true that when we're happier, um, we're more able um, to turn outward and uh, to think about what we can do to make positive changes in the world. Um, so thank you very much and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you so much, Craig was frantically scribbling down some tips there, <laughs> and I'm going to pull my copies of the Happiness Project and other uh, books off the shelf and review because it's great stuff to keep in mind at this time. So we have a couple of questions that have come up in the chat, and then I have a few that have come in separately. Um, 
So here's a pretty simple question, but I'm sure it's something that's going on with a lot of us. Um, a little bit of a, that outer order intercom subject matter. Lots of people and families are now juggling masks and gloves and new constant use items that also need to be clean or kept separate. Have you and your family discovered some good ways for keeping those things separate and being clear about which ones are clean and which ones are, et cetera? You know, I think the key thing is to have a system and then to have everybody agree on a system, which is not easy. Um, because, and also you sort of have to form all these habits anew. Uh, I, like how long did it take to form the habit of putting your keys away in the same place, right? But now we have all these habits. Um, but I think it's important to say, okay, what what is the rule that we're all going to stick to? And if you break it, okay, fine. But now here, like, let's re, let's recommit to it. What is a problem is when there's sort of the decision fatigue of, well, I think this, but maybe that, and you say this, but maybe we're doing it this way. Well, I feel uncomfortable because you're not doing that. Um, also, I heard an interview with Kate Bowler, um, and she made an, an, uh, a suggestion that I thought was really good, especially now um, when we're in a period where it used to be very clear, like, don't do this, don't do that, stay home. Like, you know, it was pretty clear. Now they're starting to be more nuanced, and people are starting to split on what they think. And that could be true in a household, and that's certainly true kind of in, uh, in a city uh, and across the country. So one thing to, you can do is to say once a week, we will examine what is the research shows, what do, what's the government guidelines, and we're going to decide what are our rules for this week. And then we're not going to question them until next week. Because the decision fatigue of constantly, should I, shouldn't I, is this okay, is that okay, can I do this, can you do that? It's very draining. And so if you sort of say, okay, once a week, we're gonna like look at it because there's so much information. It's all changing so fast. You know, for a while it was like, don't bother with masks. Now it's like, don't go anywhere without a mask. It's like, okay, if we look at it once a week, we don't have to constantly juggle this, um, but we'll make a reasoned decision based on the best evidence that we have. And then we're gonna let that guide our actions. And we're all gonna agree what that looks like because we're gonna talk about it. Um, now, this is easier said than done, obviously. Um, and it's probably going to get trickier going forward. Um, but I think that's that's what helps us to be very clear. That kind of clarity makes it easier to act. Excellent. So kind of jumping off of that, um, what silver linings have you found during this quarantine time? Could be grandiose or small scale. Um, what positive things will you take away? Well, you know, that's a great question because I think that's something that all of us are asking. Like, this is an experiment. It's not an experiment we would have chosen. It's not an experience we're happy about. And nevertheless, it's an opportunity to really learn and see, like, you know, what, what can we learn and gain from this? Now, I think I'm like many people where I'm just like, I have a college age daughter. And of course I was devastated that she had to come back and like, you know, be away. But for me, it's been wonderful. Um, my daughters both get along very well. And so it's just been, it's just been wonderful to have this family time. Um, we've been playing a board game called uh, Ticket to Ride, um, which is kind of in my mind. Oh yeah, you've thumbs up, all right. Um, um, uh, usually I don't like games. And so for me, it's very exciting to have a game I like. Um, and I think, you know, for the rest of our lives, it's like we will remember this period. It's because it's like ticket to ride. Um, and so this family time has been great. And just like, uh, you know, I haven't seen my husband this much ever, um, you know, um, also traveling. Um, I love to travel, but in a way it's also very draining. And so like I accidentally pulled up a, a, a boarding pass on my phone, like I hit some app. It's like, wow, it felt like something that I hadn't seen since high school. You know, I was like, wow, I forgot about like like uh, travel size luggage and all that stuff. Um, and um, I do feel like, uh, I mean, we're all frustrated with, with video chat and we want to get back to in real life, but it does seem like there's so many ways now that we can use technology in a way that we didn't realize. Um, if you listen to Happier Podcast, my co-host is my sister, uh, Elizabeth, and she's a type one diabetic and she lives in Los Angeles where of course it's a nightmare to get anywhere. Um, and she was saying that this is going to be huge for her because she and her doctor have realized, he always insisted that she come in in person. And now they're realizing, well, she needs to come in like every third or fourth visit, but really it's not necessary. And this is, this is and, and I talked to people who are therapists who are really realizing some people do better, like they're less likely to cancel if they can do it this way because it's just so much logistically easier. So there's all these gains in, I think, the telemedicine. Um, I'm wondering, I don't know if people have like teenage or young adult children, um, 
but all these kids getting more sleep. You know, there's all this research about how children are sort of chronically underslept in schools, you know, speaking of morning people and night people, uh, teenagers and young adults are very owlish in their just like in, in, their, in their, it's just developmentally appropriate for them. It's like, I wonder if there's going to be, I'm sure there's people studying, are there cognitive gains that are being gained by children and teenagers who are sleeping more and probably sleeping more in accordance with what their natural rhythm would be. Um, so again, it's nothing that we would have picked, but I think that we're going to learn a lot um, from this period because it's, it's such a dramatic shift um, that it's going to make certain kinds of things very clear. Thank you very much. Uh, that is a lot of silver linings, actually. It's, it's great. Uh, and as you say, we wouldn't have wished this on anyone, but embracing the positive aspects is, is worthwhile in itself. So um, this next question, I think, is a little bit in the same direction. How do you frame happiness when so many of the activities that have traditionally brought you happiness aren't available right now and may not be available in the near future. I mean, you talked a little bit about traveling. What are some other things that fall? Well, you know, anyway? that is a really, really important question. I think a lot of people are asking that. And um, like one of the things is the summer, right? I think for a lot of people, like the summer has all kinds of associations and a lot of those things aren't going to happen. Like your children aren't going to be going to summer camp and maybe you're not going to be taking the holiday that you've been looking forward to. And maybe you're not going to go to the beach the way you did. Or if you do go to the beach, it's not going to be the same beach. Or, um, you know, you're going to do some kind of, I don't when it, I don't think the marathons go in the summer. I know nothing about sports, but the sports, you know, all the things that for many people go into the pool, uh, many of these things are going to be disrupted. So I think the thing, and I've been trying to do this myself, is to sort of think like, well, what is the, what are sort of some of the essential things um, that would make it feel like the summer for me? Um, and so mm -hmm. to try to capture that. So maybe it's, you know, uh, walking in the park. And so you're like, well, I can walk in the park. Uh, maybe it's, you know, last summer I had my summer of Proust. Uh, maybe you're like, okay, this summer I'm going to read all of Jane Austen or whatever. Um, uh, to give it kind of a summer feeling. Um, and then like with things like getting together with friends, I mean, it's funny with Zoom because I think there was the Zoom rush to Zoom and then the Zoom fatigue. And now do people want to be on Zoom? Do they not want to be on Zoom? Or are they sick of Zoom? It's like it's everybody's in a different place. Um, but to try to figure out ways to connect with people, even if you can't like go out for happy hour or meet for coffee or do whatever, it, you know, or even just something like running into people on the street or you're doing drop off with your kids. And so you see those, it's just this easy, low touch way of staying connected to people. I, and, and then they're the people, I've talked to so many people who are like, I want to be alone in a crowd. I want to be in a crowded coffee shop on my laptop or I want to be in the horn blower room and no I can't make a peep I can't talk to anybody I can't even bang on my keyboard but I feel the quiet presence of other people and that kind of companionable thing just right before all this well in 2020 at the beginning of 2020 I decided to do an experiment where I would go to the Metropolitan Museum every single day of the year and part of what I loved about it I realized once I couldn't go was just the quiet presence of other people just everybody minding their own business but everybody kind of interested in the same thing it was just like a quiet peaceful I mean, it's people from all over the world in this beautiful you know cavernous space and we miss that and so but again maybe this will help sharpen our appreciation for things that we take for granted because it's easy to say oh well who wants to be on a crowded bus but now I'm thinking oh my gosh I cannot wait to be on a crowded bus I can't wait you know I can't wait for that I can't wait to like I can't get a seat in the hornblower room right that's gonna feel great um, so part of it is to realize, like, these things will come back in some way, um, and we can appreciate them all the more, and, th and then try to figure out, like, how can we create the hack um, to replace it in the meantime. And just even thinking about the pleasant anticipation of some of those things that might not have been pleasantly anticipated before. Yeah. I mean, it would be a powerful tool right there. Um, thinking about what's essential for summer popsicles come to my mind. There you um, go. We had someone in the chat who mentioned, um, what about theater, opera, ballet, and symphony? I'm not sure if you mean uh, places you, we can't be right now that you'd like to be. I would also mention, of course, that a lot of that is streaming now where it was not before, which is a different experience. Ah, more the question of um, we miss those things 
now how do we deal with that when we don't have that to make us happy or help us be happy yeah, I, I mean it, it really is very sad and especially being in new york city which is just like the heart of so many of these grand cultural institutions mm -hmm. we do, i think we feel the pain of it maybe more than anywhere else in the world because we just like this is the seat of so many like wonderful cultural mm -hmm. traditions like that I was just reading there was a new york times article and somebody said grand op you cannot have grand opera without crowds like that is <sighs> you know the p you can't do it. It's not the same, and it isn't the same. And there are either, I, and all these institutions are like putting things online and making things available, but it's not the same. And they don't, you know, it isn't the same. One thing I've been trying to do is to use this time to like educate myself more by like reading up on things because I'm not going. And so maybe if you can't go to the opera, you can't go to the symphony or something. Maybe this is a time to say like, oh, I really want to, like, kind of systematically get more familiar with a particular composer or something like that, so that you feel like at least you're using this time to like so that you'll bring more to the experience once you're feeling it again now I think another thing and I mean I, all cultural institutions are thinking about this is like what does the future look like going forward given that they have missed this huge the, just this huge gap in their in their schedules and so I think that is also something that's worrying all of us which is you know what is what is the future of these institutions um, so that's another thing that's adding to the uncertainty of this time and kind of the uneasiness of this time is how it's falling on individual people People and businesses and also on um, some of the great cultural institutions of the world. Yeah, very much so. <clears throat> um, someone asks, do you have any specific ideas or might say maybe a favorite idea about how to best serve others during this time? Um, they're trying to figure out how best to help. So that's a great question. I wrote a post about it on my uh, website, GretchenRubin.com, where I talked about sort of like what I was doing, um, and uh, which seems like very little. I mean, it, it's very hard to feel like you're, you're, you know, uh, that what you're doing is proportionate um, to what the the immensity of of the circumstances. Um, but we we have to begin by doing what we can do with our own lives. Um, so just for what it's worth, what I did was um, I did some research and we talked about it as a family um, about what organizations we wanted to donate to. Now, this is not so easy because there's lots of organizations and of course you want to make wise choices. And there, there, there are places like Charity Navigator and uh, you know different ones that can help you choose wisely. And fortunately right now there's been a ton of um, articles written um, looking at if you're interested in bail reform, these are the organizations that are doing a great job. If you want to do something locally, these are the great, this is the place if you want to like help Minneapolis or whatever, um, so that you can really kind of drill down on what's important to you and give wisely because, you know, nobody wants to just, and, and you know, and sadly there are people who take advantage of this and, you know, create, you know, where it's not a good use of your time and your money and, um, and the high what are the causes you believe in? Educate yourself and then give to them. So that's what we did as a family. For what it's worth, we gave the Braille Project and the NAACP uh, Legal Defense and Education Fund. But there's there in my post, I post to I think it was on the on, in the cut was um, website, which is like a New York magazine uh, mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, vertical. They had one that went through a lot of different ones and talking about kind of why you might pick one or the other. Um, and the other thing that I'm doing is I'm really trying to educate myself more. And so I love to read. Um, and when I, I've been following very closely with Society Library, it's going to start lending out books again because I'm a gigantic library list. And I've really decided that I'm going to spend the summer, at least, really reading many more books about racial justice, racial inequality, the books by black authors, and really, you know, which I do all the time. Um, like. Nadia Korafor, like I'm, uh, my sister and I have an Instagram live book club, and we had already picked it. Oh yeah, you're Sarah. She's right in your alley. Yeah, you Nadia Korafor is like, <laughs> yeah, we share that kind of science fiction fantasy thing. I know. Um, so it's like, but to highlight that, to to really like educate myself, learn more about what's going on, and also then you know to shine a spotlight on people whose work I admire and that I think is really important. So that's something that that I want to do, and I, you know it's interesting. Um, there was a report that the top 10 audiobooks uh, of the last week, top selling, were all books that were like anti-racist books. Um, and I imagine, uh, Sarah, it will be very interesting to see when the library opens to see, I bet, like how long the wait lists are gonna get for certain books that everyone's dying to read. Um, and somebody was saying like, they tried to order uh, The Fire Next Time, which is one of James Baldwin's most famous books. And they were like, okay, oh, yeah, that's like, that's back ordered for months, which is good in a way, because it shows that many people are realizing like, 
it's time to learn. It's time to um, really, uh, really do that. And again, it feels like, oh, so that, that's like not that much to do. Um, but it is something that we can do with our own lives. And then I think from there, maybe see other possibilities of like where we would want to engage and get involved. Yeah, very much so. Um, yes, this is already showing in the libraries, uh, you know, ebooks and holds and so forth as well. And we're very much hoping to encourage and build on that and, and uh, build further awareness and encourage reading in the subject. So you could do absolutely. one of your little tables by the by the uh, the checkout when counter. We have the you lobby do like back, National absolutely. Poetry Month. And, yeah. I look forward to the lobby table being back. I mean, no, right? We all want the lobby table. Um, so here's a um, kind of specific question. Can you give some advice to families who are working on being happier together and which include a family member with a difference like autism or a learning disability or an illness or physical disability? Um, just kind of keeping everybody participating and doing as well as possible during times of transition, during times of uncertainty. That is, that's a really uh, important question. And I think it really comes down to this idea of um, relationships and also a feeling of safety and security and that people can be counted mm -hmm. on. Um, I think that in the end, if you feel like someone loves you and you can count on that, um, it covers a lot of mistakes and it covers a lot of losing your temper or things not going right. Um, I heard a story, a friend of mine was telling me how, um, so she's working from home and she's got an older child who, um, I forget what grade he's in, and then she has a younger child who has special needs. And so in the morning, she was spending much more time with her son who had special needs because it was like hard to get on the Zoom and you know all this stuff that everybody has to fuss with. Um, but then at some point when it was getting to be around lunchtime, she would uh, text her older son and say, what do you want for lunch? Is there anything in particular you're in the mood for? And then she'd go fix lunch. And then when he was done with his class and they were all done, they'd eat lunch together. She didn't really think anything of it. It was one of those habits that you fall into by default. You don't even realize you're creating a habit or that you're creating expectations on other people. It just like seems like the easy, obvious thing to do. And before you know it, um, you've got a habit. So one day she pulled a muscle in her back and she said she was just in agony. She could hardly move. So she's there with her younger son. And then she's like, oh my gosh, okay, I'm just going to let them fend for themselves for lunch. Like they're big enough. They can deal with it. Make, make a peanut butter sandwich. And, um, you know, I, I, just, I just need to lie down. And her son was furious, furious with her and was like, I can't believe it. Like, I'm so hungry. There's no food. And I thought, oh my gosh, like, is she going to be angry with him? Is she going to be like, are you so spoiled? Are you so, so, so self-centered and so lazy that you cannot make yourself a peanut butter sandwich when I'm like in so much pain? But my friend was so much wiser and she said, oh, I understand. It's like, it's these little gestures that make us feel cared for and taken care of. And he just needed to know that I was like, hey, honey, what do you want for lunch today? That's all he needed and he counted on it. And I didn't even know he was counting on it. And I thought, you know, that is just like, but in the end, it's like, it's fine because now she gets it and he gets it. And because that love and that consistency is there. Um, so I think that's what goes the, a long way. Um, especially when there's so much uncertainty and anxiety in the world. And everybody can do that, it seems to me. The, the little gestures, you know, everybody in whatever situation in the, in the family can do that. Yeah, 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 to try to do that, yeah. Um, good, well, we're gonna kind of move towards wrapping up. We've got a couple more questions, uh, if that's good with you. Um, can you sneak us a little bit more information about the upcoming book about the senses? Mm, yes, and if anybody has any suggestions, I'm like, I love getting suggestions. Um, so it's a book about how to get to the mind through the body, um, because a lot of times you can minister to the spirit through the body. And so, and I'm one of these people who's just like constantly up in my head and very distracted. And so I really wanted to ground myself in my, in my senses. So it's about the sense of smell, which I've been obsessed with for a long time color and sight, which I love. Part of this is that I'm going to the Metropolitan Museum every day and I'll be back there. I think July 15th is the day um, pretty soon. Um, and then uh, and then kind of I have my own senses that I add to the like kindergarten five, which is people, time, uh, pattern and symbol, which uh, you know I make my own argument for that. Um, so it's really just an exploration. It's everything from like why ketchup is amazing. Like don't even get me started about like why ketchup is amazing. Um, and then and then things like the power of symbol to, to you know transform our experience. Um, and I'm I just love it because especially 
in a time where it's easy to just kind of spin out, it just brings me back um, into my physical experience. And um, so it's a very great pleasure uh, to work on that. Um, and uh, like every book that I write, I'm like, it's never going to be this good again. This is, this is it. Like nothing's going to be as fascinating as this subject. And then I, and then I'm like, yeah. no, this one's, this is good. <laughs> So any, 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 any resources that people, I get, I'd like the world is my research assistant. People are like, oh, there's a podcast episode about perfume or, you know, there's this great book called The Secret Life of Color. I'm like, yes, Kesha St. Clair, it's my favorite book on color. Yes. Yeah, so um, I'm having a lot of fun. Very with good. That. Yeah. Well, we're looking forward to that one a lot. Um, any quicker favorite tip about what to do when you feel blocked? Yes. Like you're trying to read something or you're trying to write something or you're trying to move on to the next big thing in life even, just ways to approach that. Well, there's sort of like the big and the small. So the big is a lot of times when people feel blocked, like if they say they have writer's block or it's like I can meet like my promises to other people, but I'm having trouble keeping promises to myself. If it's that kind of frustration or you feel like I have no time for, for self-care or my own priorities, then I always think that it's maybe as an issue of outer accountability. And so I have my whole, I have a whole personality framework that I won't take the time to explain now, um, called the four tendencies, which divides people into upholders, questioners, obligers, and rebels. And this is a particular issue for obligers, but anybody can experience this. But um, all I'll say is if you want to learn more about it, um, you can take a quiz at quiz.gretchenrubin.com and it will tell you what you are and give you a little report, kind of overview about how you might think about it. And then there's tons of resources on my site if you want it, if it rings, if it rings true to you. If you're like, oh, when I was in track team, when I was in high school, I was on the track team. I never missed track practice. So why can't I go running now? I'm like, okay, you're an obliger. Okay. Um, so that can be a way that people will feel blocked or frustrated. But then there's another kind of thing which I think is happening right now, which is where people just like, they can't get their head in the game. It's like, I just can't focus. So if you're getting to that where you feel like I can't transition from one part of life to another part of life and I can't settle into something the way I once did, one thing you might think about is like transitional tasks. Because, you know, just like we don't expect little kids to go from like playing Legos and to like lying in bed and going to sleep, they need transitions. We also need transitions. So a transition that I really like is just cleaning up because I do outer order contributes to inner column for me. So if you say, okay, I'm going to take 10 minutes and just like clean up my office and like just like make create physical order, or maybe I'm going to go into the kitchen and just kind of put dishes in the dishwasher that can be kind of settling it can help kind of calm you to create that outer order also if it's like hard to go from family life to work life say um to maybe give yourself an intermediate task like not to jump into something that's like very high and intellectually demanding but to do something like maybe you read industry newsletters um or maybe you need to review something for typos or something where it's related to work so it's stepping you into that work part of your mind but it's not, you're not asking yourself to like really focus because I think right now, especially people are finding it hard to switch, um, especially if you often use physical location as a way to create these boundaries. At work, I think about work. Then in my commute, I kind of have that buffer. And then at home, I think about home. Well, that's kind of been breaking down anyway because of technology and email and such. I mean, and I think a lot of people miss the old buffers that we used to have. Um, but now there is no buffer. And um, it can be really unsettling to be like doing a Zoom call and your like three-year-old is wandering by. We're all used to it now. We all find it charming. But it's still, it's kind of unsettling and it can, it can mess with your head. Um, so I'm a big fan of transitions. I think that that can really help if people are find, finding it hard to sort of move forward. Excellent. I got one more question, and it's just a happy question, I think. Um, one sees the phrase a lot, somebody's in their happy place, or they need to go to their happy place. <laughs> yes. And we like to think that that's libraries. Yes. <laughs> um, any thoughts about that phrase or about libraries, if you like? No, absolutely. And I think it's a great idea to have a happy place and to just be someplace where you know if you go, you can count on it. I think for some people, it's like their favorite coffee shop where they love the music and they love the smell and they love the coffee. Um, and definitely, I absolutely feel like libraries are my happy place. That's been true ever since I was little. Um, I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri, and we had this cool library that had like very 70s, like this two-story two <laughs> glass tube with water bubbling in it. And um, it was like downstairs was the children. And then I remember when I used to go upstairs to the adult, and it was so exciting. 
um, in college and in law school. I spent hours and hours in a library. I met my husband. My husband had the Carol behind me in law school. That's how I met him. Um, and then New York Society Library, it's like, and it's like different moods. Like sometimes I like the little desk that's in the corner of the fiction section. I think it's the P, it's the Fs, right? I think I am right, sit right in front of Penelope Fitzgerald or something. Um, and then there's the big room where you can work with everybody. And then, you know, it's just, uh, it just, and then all those books, all this, all that possibility, it's just really exciting. Yeah, so to me, there's nothing, nothing is happier than a library because it just, it just holds so much promise. I like to just look at the titles. I will check out a book because I like the title or I like the cover. Um, what, Sarah, what was the name? Was it Phyllis Rose who wrote the book where she just read one shelf of the book? The shelf, yes. It's called The Shelf. It's a terrific read. It's really insightful. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Where she's just like, I'm just going to read this one shelf and like see what it reveals. And I was like, oh my gosh, it sounds like so, so fun. Um, yes, so I, and I know that the library needs our support. So um, everybody like, like we, we can't wait to get back there. Um, so we got to make sure it stays strong. Thank you so much, Gretchen, for your words of support, but thank you so much for this uh, really lovely event. I personally feel happier having oh, been yeah. here, and I hope others do too, <laughs> but I think we're all taking away something large or small that we can uh, do to improve life and the lives of others as well, so thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to close this down now, but um, you're, everyone listening is welcome to email events at nysociallive.org. Um, let us know your feedback on this event. Let us know what else you'd like to see in the future. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.